Hey, Evelyn. It's been about a, a little over a week into your trip, and we've been talking a lot. And I thought that I'd make this little video just to kind of summarize a lot of the topics we discussed because it's going to be hard to remember because we talked about so much. So. So with all the exercise you were doing, we talked a lot about muscles, right? And we talked about how the muscles work in your body and the different exercises you can do. So muscle on top of your arm like that, that's your bicep. And that's the one that pulls things toward you. Like I'm pulling, that makes that muscle work. The muscles on the bottom are called your tricep. When you push, pushing away is what makes those muscles work. These muscles right here on your shoulder, they're your delts. And they're the muscles for pushing up. So when you're, you're pushing something up, those are your delts. Muscle on top of your shoulders like that, those are called traps. There, there's, there's a long Latin name for all these, and I don't know the Latin name, so I'm, I'm not talking about that. But the short term, traps. And those are the muscles for shrugging your shoulders. So like if you're lifting something, you go, oof. Those are your traps. Muscles on your chest right there, those are your pectoral muscles, your pecs. And those are for when you're pushing away. So you're pushing away, you're doing a push-up, that exercises your pectoral muscles. The muscles on your back, they're your lats, and you have two of them. You have upper lats and you have lower lats. Now your upper lats are the ones when you're pulling yourself up. So these you use those a lot when you're doing rock climbing because you're pulling up <clears throat> and these muscles right here get activated. The lower lats, and you can see there's a little bit of a difference there, is when you're pulling toward you. So you pull toward you and the lats activate you push away, your pecs work. So pull, lats, push, pecs. Push, delts, pull, lats. And these muscles work with each other. And then your, your stomach, these are your abdominal muscles. Those are when you're doing crunches, like you're, you're doing sit-ups, you're pulling yourself up. And these abdominal muscles, they go all the way up your body, actually. They're, they're, they're pretty... They're pretty big and they're really important. So it's important to have strong abdominals. Your thighs, these are your quads. There's four muscles here, here and here. And those are important for jumping and for sitting up. See those muscles activate? So all of the work on the trampoline you're doing, that builds your quads and also the rock climbing. Because remember with rock climbing, you push yourself up with your feet and you stabilize yourself with your hands. So your quads are really important. Another important muscle is your calf muscle. Your calves are what lets you stand on your tiptoes. See? I'm standing on my tiptoes like this. I'm activating my calf muscles. And then you've got your glutes. And your glutes are really important too because they go all the way from up here down into your legs. And any time that you run or you squat down and up, you're activating your glutes. So when you're doing exercises or you're doing some sport, you're using all these muscles together. And that's also important to coordinate them into practice. So after you do an exercise, like you spend an hour climbing or you run or you go to the gym and you, you go to the trampoline gym, then that means you broke down some of the muscles and you have to build them back up. And you do that by eating protein and fat and all sorts of good things in order to uh, get your body to build new muscles. And that means the next time you're going to be stronger. And that, that's really important. So getting plenty of exercise and drinking water and eating protein and fat and carbs to give your body the strength it needs is absolutely important. 
one thing we talked about was we talked about systems of government. We talked about the importance of a republic as opposed to democracy. This was first emphasized by Plato and Socrates in Greece, where they pointed out that democracies really were chaos and mob rule. So the minority, the, the people who you know, were not in the majority of that mob, uh, they would typically get trampled. And it's only through a republic government which has a set of rules that everyone has to obey that we can represent everyone and protect the people that are, for example, you know, foreigners or, or people with different religious views that are living in our society. Now, we live in a constitutional republic and I, I think our constitution is pretty great. Uh, in our constitutional republic, it's a constitutional democracy, so our government is, is uh, the representatives that hold the office are selected by voting. And there's a difference between the office and the person. Now, the office is, you know, for example, the office of the president and the person who's elected are people such as, you know, Bill Clinton, George Bush, uh, Barack Obama, Donald Trump. And they change, but the important thing is how we maintain control of that office. And in our country, we've been having a problem that the presidency keeps getting stronger and stronger. And this has really happened ever since uh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt in in the uh, you know turn of the uh, turn of the 20th century, and in recent years it's, it's gotten more problematic. With, for example, uh, John Kennedy when the president began having wars without having Congress declare these wars. And in recent years, in particular, uh, after the uh, terrorist attacks on September 11, uh, we've seen the president's power become even even greater. So it'd be really nice to see the executive branch become a little bit less powerful. We talked about trees and plants, and about how trees and plants are about a balance. You've got the foliage on the top, and you've got the roots on the bottom. The roots, they bring in water and minerals and nutrients, and they shoot them up to the leaves. The leaves combine water and minerals and sunlight to produce sugar, and they send the sugar down through the rest of the tree and into the roots. And it's a balance between, it's a balance between roots and leaves. If you have too few roots and too many leaves, your leaves are going to die back and fall off the plant. Perhaps not all of them, but a lot of them are. That's because you don't have enough water and minerals coming in to support the leaves. In contrast, if you have uh, more roots than leaves, for example, you go through and you cut all the leaves off, well then the plant suddenly goes crazy and starts making leaves all over the place. And some of the roots are going to die back too. And the system allows trees to, to have uh, an underground part, which is, you know, in the case of trees, can be huge. They can have root systems which are bigger than the trees themselves. And an above ground part where sugar is produced and, and sent. Now in the fall, these leaves, uh, they start falling off and the sugars in the tree go down into the roots. And that's how trees hibernate through the winter and they, they stay safe in the cold is because they store all that energy and all that sugar in the roots. And that's also why a lot of times people and animals will eat the roots of plants in, in the winter because the roots, like beets and turnips, all the, all the sugar is being stored in the roots. And when the spring comes and it starts warming up 
and the sap starts flowing then the sugar from the roots that's being stored there goes up into the, into the branches and that causes leaves to be uh, grown and it makes new branches and new bark grow and you get uh, this tree waking up in the springtime and it makes flowers and does all that. So the seasons are caused by the storage of sugars. So for me, when I got these little bonsai, in the winter time, I'm gonna take them and I'm gonna uh, put them on the ground and I'm gonna put a cardboard box over the top of them to protect them from the cold because they're not you know, really in the ground. And after I, I put a cardboard box on them, I'll leave them there for, you know, four or five months. And when the spring comes, I'll take the cardboard box off so that they can start warming up and uh, come out of hibernation for the winter. Uh, we talked about the ideas of the Enlightenment because our government was the first uh, constitutional democracy based on the philosophies of the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment, that was uh, a kind of philosophical and political awakening that happened uh, in Europe. And it's where the first ideas came about that, you know, the king really has no reason to be the king, right? The king isn't born special. The king's just like everyone else and should be treated like everyone else. And that's where the idea that, hey, we should have a government without a king and we should have people rule themselves. Now, our government and our political philosophy is based on what's called negative liberty, right? And negative liberty means that we talk about all the things that government can't do. Government cannot uh, stop your free speech. The government cannot search your car without a warrant. The government cannot uh, make soldiers stay in your house during a time of peace. That's negative liberty. Now, in contrast, the uh, European uh, democracies and European republics were founded on the idea of positive liberty. The government must. The government must provide you security. The government must provide you education. The government must provide you uh, health care. And there's a big difference in those two in terms of the stability. And what I mean is that in the U.S., if you and your neighbor disagree on everything, you know, if you say, you know, it's dark at night, he'll say it's, it's bright at night and dark during the day. You disagree on everything. Well, the two of you can live next to each other, never see each other, and just live and let live. You disagree, but you both get to live your lives the way you want. That's because with negative liberty, you don't actually have to interact with a guy much, right? You both are basically free to believe what you want to believe, even if, you know, you're both wrong or both right or whatever it is, you don't have to interact with a person. In the case of positive liberty, however, then the two of you interact all the time. For example, the government's required to give you public education. Well, what if one of you thinks the world is flat and one of you thinks the world is round? Well, that means you have to go and fight because the government takes money from both of you and teaches children, what are they gonna teach them? Right? Any place that the government touches your lives is where you and your neighbor are gonna have a conflict. So positive liberty means that these people that you have problems with, you're gonna have a lot of problems with all the time. And negative liberty means the governments are gonna be much more stable. For example, the United States has had one republic and it's changed a little bit here and there due to amendments to the Constitution, but in general, it's been more or less stable. In the time that we've had one republic, France has had five. 
That's right, five republics over the course of, you know, 200 years. And that's because the, the French Republic is, is based on the concepts of positive liberty. So, and, and don't get me wrong, there, there's, there's uh, times when the, the ideas of positive liberty are very appealing. But when you really distill it down, uh, the two don't work well together. As soon as you start touching a little bit of positive liberty, then everything gets pulled into it. So uh, this is the difference between these types of government. We talked about the idea of a subconscious mind and a conscious mind, right? So your conscious mind is the part of your mind that you're aware of. It's the part of you that you know looks across the room and sees the tea kettle and says, oh, it's red. The subconscious part is the part that you really can't easily see, right? And it's the part that he says, red makes me think of fire. And it makes me think of burning. You know, you, you don't have immediate access to that. Now, subconscious mind's also where a lot of weird things happen, right? For example, you know, you can be scared of spiders. And you say, well, why am I scared of spiders? Well, and your, your conscious mind's going to come up with a lot of excuses. It's going to say, well, you're scared of spiders because you're scared of getting bitten. Or you're scared of, you know, they're going to put you in a cocoon or something, right? And you think, well, have I ever been bitten by a spider? No. Have I ever been put in a cocoon? No. Have I ever seen a spider make a, put other insects in a cocoon? No. Why am I scared? They're small and I'm big. I can squish them. Heck, even if they bite me, I'll look at the bite and then I'll squish them. You have no reason to be scared of a spider, but you are. I am. And that's because in our subconscious, we have something there which says, whoa, that's scary. And our subconscious mind is where a lot of things happen. It's, it's where we have feelings. It's where we have uh, reactions to the world around us. It's, it's what makes humans actually pretty interesting. Hey, so we also talked about writing and how it's important to try to write something every day or draw something or just record what you're thinking. And, and we wrote this letter, and which I hope we have time to send between now and when you, when you leave. Uh, but writing is really important because it's, it's how you record what you're doing. And I showed you, I've got this pen for you. And at some point, remember it's this fountain pen, this little, uh, Lamy nib. And I'm hoping to give that to you sometime soon. Maybe this next, uh, winter when I come visit, uh, I didn't have ink this time, so I'm going to try to get a, a ink a filler for that. We mentioned that uh, in the U.S. our constitution breaks our government into three parts. A executive branch, which is the president, that's in charge of enforcing laws and just basically executing the, the government, making sure it works right. A legislative branch, which is the Congress, the House of Representatives, and the Senate, whose job is supposed to be uh, making laws, and a judicial branch, uh, whose job is to interpret laws and to manage, uh, for example, the justice system if a person's accused of violating a law. We talked about modern art. Right? We watch those videos about, uh, about abstract form and about drip paintings. Remember those? Yeah, we talked about how uh, art over the course of 40 years went from pure uh, representation, art, where an artist's job was to represent the world, to being an artist whose job was to represent the abstract, and in, in particular, art went from representing the outside world to representing inside people. So a person would, would draw a painting, and the painting's job is to help the viewer think about what the viewer is seeing. So you'll stand in front of this, and, and the painting will look different to everyone, because everyone's subconscious and everyone's 
experiences and feelings are going to be different. Remember, the art, at least your father's interpretation of art, is that something is art if it helps you, if, if it makes you feel an emotion. You look at a painting and you say, yeah, this painting makes me feel angry or happy. Or we saw the scream, right? And you said, that's a scary painting. Remember, the artist was saying that, that he was walking along and he was in, uh, he was in Iceland. And he turned the corner and all of a sudden the sky was filled with uh, blood and streams of fire. And he heard nature have this silent scream. And he was terrified. And that's why he painted that painting. And if you look at the painting, it's, it's not a very good painting. I mean, it's a the type of painting that, you know, you could probably draw in, in you know, a year or two of practice. Right? It does not take a lot of uh, technical talent. But the artist was able to access uh, deep human emotions and express that terror of you know, seeing a sky that's full of fire and blood. And that was pretty, pretty cool. I mean, that's, a, that's good art because you look at it and you say, wow, that's really scary. So, an, an artist is, is, gonna, is someone that can then help you with that. And, you know, the more abstract art, the art you look at and say, Ooh, what is that? You know, drip paintings, for example, of, of uh, uh, Jackson Pollock. You look at those and, and you see, what does this mean? What is it? Well, it doesn't really have meaning, but it, it has a feeling. And, and some of them are feelings about, about you know, loneliness and some of them are feelings about energy or uh, solitude but they're all designed to try to access part of of who you are on the inside we talked about how the plumbing of a sink works you've got the garbage disposal which you can take apart first by unplugging it and checking that it's off and then disconnecting it from the sink. That's an air tube. This is the drain tube. The drain tube is connected by a uh, set of screws. You can take it apart if you have to, but you really don't want to. When you have a clog, the clog is typically down in this section. This section is connected by two quick release components, which have plastic O-rings inside of them, and then one a component that requires a wrench to move. The clog is right in here, so you loosen the quick release and this quick release, swing it out, and you can clean it out. It's important to remember when you're reassembling it to keep this running downhill and this component running downhill. If they don't run downhill, then you wind up with a situation where your plumbing backs up.